Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? Have a good, good time? Nearly there? I was worried that I was going to be in between you and drinks, but apparently that's not tonight, so I feel a bit better. So let's get started. So who loves Kelsey Hightower? Right? Show of hands, everybody. Right. So Kelsey wrote this uh, a while back, and he has a very good point, right? Like, we keep creating these new things, but they don't support the old stuff, so we have to migrate every time everything and rewrite everything, right? And it's a bad idea. And now my talk's going to be about basically everything Kelsey's writing here, so sorry for, for making his life worse. But how do we deal with the fact that we actually want to move to these new technologies, and we want to use those to like, get the benefit out of them, right? Like, like the resiliency of cloud providers, et cetera. And we don't want these old applications, these monoliths, to like, stop our growth as developers and operations and to slow down our development pace, right? So how do we deal with that? So I'm actually going to talk about exactly that, where we take an uh, example Microsoft, or, sorry, uh, monolithic application, and we're going to turn it into microservices. We're going to move it to Kubernetes, and we're going to move it to multi-cloud. And I'm going to do this entire demo. It's going to be local on my laptop. And I'm going to share the Git repo with all of you so you can actually download it yourself and follow all these steps that I'm doing as well. Right? So we're going to be simulating networks, isolating everything, spinning up multiple Kubernetes clusters, um, and going to work with that. So my name is Eric Veld, and I'm a de developer advocate at HashiCorp. Um, if you don't know HashiCorp, you might know one of these products. So we make Terraform, Vault, Console, Nomad, Packer, Vagrant. I think that was all of them. Wait for the pictures. <laughs> so this is the link. I'll put it on again at the end of the talk if you want to get that. If you want a picture of the link, I'll wait for that. <laughs> Everybody done? Good. Still one? OK. <laughs> You'll get it at the end. <laughs> So as Kelsey said, right, how do we get ourselves into this mess? Well, basically, it's because we are trying to go multi. What do I mean with multi? Right? So the first multi is multi-service, where we start off with this monolithic application running on one server. Everything is fine, no difficulty. We're moving to VMs. I'm pretty sure everybody here is already running on VMs. And now we're moving to even smaller ephemeral containers, right? Applications that get scheduled by Kubernetes. They move from one server to the other. They go up, down, depending on health checks. And that's awesome. But they have a few challenges as well, right? Like if your applications keep moving from one server to the other, how do we deal state with stateful applications, right? Where do we put our state? Um, or if we're actually moving from these monolithic applications to these microservices, how do we deal with that transition and do that in a way where it's sustainable and not like Kelsey said, where we have to rewrite everything, just big bang migration. And that's both in architecture and in organization, because if you move to microservices, you also need to adapt your organization to support that. And then, of course, if we move everything into microservices, they have to talk to each other, and we still need to keep that secure. Because we're moving from uh, calls inside an application to calls over the network. And we all know that networks are super stable. They never go down. They're super secure. It'll, it'll be totally fine. So the second one is multi-platform. We see a lot of organizations that don't go all in on just Kubernetes. They say, for instance, take GKE on Google Cloud, and then they put other applications in Cloud Functions or Cloud Run. They still have VMs. A lot of organizations still have applications that won't run in the cloud. Say, for instance, mainframe applications at banks. They're still there. So you see a lot of uh, mix and match and pick and choose and create your own menu of what you're running. And that, again, causes some uh, new challenges. A lot of organizations are scared of vendor lock-in. 
but is it really that big a problem? Because if you are so afraid of vendor lock-in, that basically means you can't use 90% of the cloud offerings that will make your life so much easier. It's, it's a trade-off that you have to find there. And by using all these different services, which are in themselves pretty complex, and we're combining all of them into this big networked application, because there's no one-size-fit-all, right? There's no platform that solves all your problems. It just creates a very complex uh, whole. And then, again, security. If we put everything together, how do we uh, secure the communication between all these services? And the last multi is multi-cloud, which basically has all those challenges of going multi-platform. It's just so much more hard. Like Everything just amplifies. It becomes more difficult. It becomes more complex. It the security will be more difficult because now you're having to connect applications from one cloud to applications in the other cloud. So it's just amplified, right? A lot of those challenges come down to networking challenges, right? And then especially three common challenges in those is what do I name my service? And how do I find it, right? Like, how do we glue these things together so they know about each other? Then how do we make sure that those services are actually allowed to talk to each other so it's not just a free-for-all and we throw everything open? And then once I know if I'm allowed to talk to the service and where to find it, how do I actually route things from one cloud to the other, right? We're going to need a lot of glue. So let's start with tackling the first one, naming things and routing like 50% of it, right? Because routing on multi-cloud and multi-platform, that's the next step, which will be a bit more hard. So how would we normally solve that problem, right? We'd use load balancers or proxies, right? If we have a static environment where you have a VM and it has one application, we know the IP of that VM. We know the ports it needs. If it needs to talk to something else, we know all those details. And we can just write some uh, load balancer configuration that'll route from one to the other. Um, and then if you start moving to a bit more dynamic infrastructure, where you have more VMs and they're in auto-scaling groups, et cetera, you might start to generate that configuration. Say, for instance, you're using console for service discovery. You can then query that and then generate all the routes for a load balancer. But these days, we also have a different way to solve this problem, which is service mesh. Is anybody here using a service mesh? OK, that's quite a few. Oh, you kind of, OK. <laughs> So the way service mesh solves that is instead of having these central load balancers where all the traffic has to go through and basically becoming a very critical part of your infrastructure, these small proxies get placed with your application, right? And they get configured by the control plane, which is responsible for keeping the service catalog, making sure authentication and authorization is everything correct, and configuring the control plane, which in pretty much every uh, service mesh is Envoy. So if you want to compare service meshes, in, in the bottom line, it's just Envoy, and they're just configuring Envoy, right? So Envoy is the magic sauce we all love. So how does this work in a bit more detail uh, to give some background, right? So we have the, the control plane, which knows the, the service graph, and we have a local client or agent, which will start the proxy for a certain uh, service. So in this case, we have a web service, and we define that we want a sidecar for it, and it wants to reach something called MySQL, and it wants to do that on localhost 8001. OK, cool. So the proxy gets started. It gets all the service discovery information about MySQL from console, and then it gets started and it's con configured. 
So then the naming things, right? How does the service mesh do that? Well, when the proxy gets started, as I said, it gets the service discovery information of all the upstreams, so it can generate the local configuration with all the clusters and listeners. So when the proxy starts, it'll be, hey, where's database? It gets the current IP and port of the database, writes that in its local configuration, and if anything changes in the, the service catalog, it'll get automatically regenerated and it has the new configuration automatically. So the naming things is then fairly easy, right? But now that we know where it is, how do we make sure that now not everybody can just talk to that IP and just configure it so, oh, I want to talk to database as well, so I'll just put that in my upstreams and then there we go. So normally, if you have a machine, you would use IP tables, right? The thing we all love to write IP table rules. So you start off with some simple rules. Uh, this IP is allowed to contact that port. And if you have a very simple environment like that, that works quite well, right? You know all the components that are there. But as soon as you start to make it a bit more dynamic, turns into something like this, and then, oh, it's very vague in the background, there's like thousands of IP table rules, and I already hate reading one IP table rule. Reading thousands of them with masquerades and forwards and drops, it's just oh, nightmares. So this usually just ends up where if applications, say for instance, are running on Kubernetes, and these containers get moved left, right, up, down, Eventually, you're not going to write this yourself anymore. You're just going to say, OK, we have this castle. We've built this wall around it with the firewall. And then we just lower the bridge and let everything in, right? Oh, we trust everything in our local network. Let's just open it up for the local network. But we're now running on cloud providers, which is basically shared hardware. Like, can we 100% trust that nothing will get on your machine, right? So what we instead want to do is move away from host-based security and go to service-based security, right? Where every service gets an identity. So when it registers itself, it gets a certificate. And then we can create rules specifically between services. So in this case, say for instance, we want to deny everything web can talk to. We could even do star to star. So basically blocking all traffic in the network, and then we can specifically allow which service is allowed to talk to which other service. So we can create an intention that says web is allowed to talk to app, and web is allowed to talk to database. Sounds really simple, right? What does it actually do? So once they figured out where database is, the proxy of web will try to establish a connection to database. Um, so it'll start a TLS handshake, and it's using the identity of web, so the certificate that was handed out for specifically for that one. And then the proxy on the other end will actually check like, yo, is web allowed to talk to database? Authorized? Yep, it looks good. Okay, so then it established this, the, the connection, and then there's mutual TLS between those proxies, right? So from one end to the other end, it's all encrypted. And we know that it's now secure because we had to authenticate ourselves with that service, and everything is blocked otherwise in the TLS handshake um, sequence. And the nice thing is, this happens on the establishment of the connection, so it doesn't have to happen every time you do a request. So the overhead is actually very minimal. So once the connection gets made, until it gets terminated, all requests can go over there, and there's literally no overhead. So I was talking about the, the demo, so let's get, get to the demo part, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start first simple. We're going to migrate to the first multi, right? We have a monolithic application, and we're going to move to microservices. So in this demo, to make sure that everybody can run it locally, I've put everything into Docker Compose so we can create networks so they're isolated from each other and can talk to each other, and then I've created a WAN network that certain applications can then connect to that we need to federate later for some of the fancier parts in the demo. 
And since I'm using containers, I'm actually going to use fat containers that'll simulate being a VM, like a very lightweight VM. They have supervisor in there instead of systemd because you know. And then we'll have a console agent in there, so it'll actually register itself as a node. And we'll have Envoy in there, and then the application. So when we register the application, console agent will start the Envoy proxy and configure it. So it'll actually look like VMs. So we're going to start off with this simple application. And I'm going to uh, be using a demo application that a colleague of mine, Nick Jackson, wrote, which is called Fake Service. And Fake service exposes all the internals of the call chain. Let me quickly switch to that one. So all these things are open, and you can, if you have to give a demo, you can just use fake service, and we can configure it through environment variables to act like a real application. Like, it can simulate errors, it can time out half of the time, it can add a delay, it can call other services. So we'll be using this to simulate our microservices and monolithic applications so we don't have to worry about me blowing up the demo because I wrote some bugs somewhere. All right, oh, zero. So we're going to start off with one service, which I'll call web, which is beautiful legacy application, although I think yesterday we uh, called it heritage application because that just sounded way more fancy. And then because we are using a payment service because we want to make a lot of money, um, our, our company, which I'll call Fake Service Incorporated, um, makes an awesome application. It's super popular, so we need to make money, so we have a payment service, right? And it basically responds to all the calls. So we want to move from this first to this, right? Because the payment service calls the currency function because it needs to know what the exchange rate is if you want to pay in rubles or dollars because we need to get the most amount of money out of the customer, so that's why we need the currency service. So we're going to split that out without changing any of the other application code and then try to move to that. So we're going to do that by just using configuration of the service mesh. Right? So we're going to create a service router that if we call just slash, we'll end up at the payment service, and we're going to create a path slash currency that will route to the currency service. And we're going to do this when you request the payments service. So we're going to do a call to the payments service. And then the proxy will actually check, like, hey, is there a special rule that I need to change my routing for? And then, oh, if it matches, we'll just redirect to currency. Right? So let's create that first setup and get this started. So the, in the demo repo, I have actually created a make file to go through all the steps, right? So if you clone this repo, you can actually go through the whole demo yourself, check every file, see how it works. Um, so I'm going to use that to step through the, the steps so I make less typos and everybody's happy, but I'm going to show all the code while we do it. So first of all, what we want to do is we want to create some environment. So we need those two networks that I was talking about. We need a private on-prem network, and we want a WAN network that will simulate the internet so some multi-cloud things can talk to each other. And then we're going to spin up one VM that will be running a console server. And I'm exposing it on uh, the local host as well, so I can just show you in the browser all the services, et cetera. Um, so let's spin this one up first, right? So make step one. Oh, and it's actually going to do some extra things, with all, with all, which I'll show you as well. So as you can see, we've created two networks, right? Let me make that even bigger. We've created two networks, on-prem and WAN. Then we've created the console VM. Um, and then we've written a little bit of configuration. And we're actually starting two extra VMs with web and payments. I'm just going to keep saying VM instead of container, because otherwise it'll get very confusing. So let's take a look at the configuration. Because now that we have the cluster, we need some applications. So in this case, we have a uh, separate version of fake service, which is the fat container with everything in there. 
So that's why it has the VM tag here. And we're just configuring web to have an upstream of payments, so it'll actually route the, the request to payments. Um, and we can reach that on port 9090 on the local host, so I can actually do the demo. And then we have the payments service, which basically just responds. And we register these in console. So we register the service web. It's listening on port 9090. So then we get the health checking, et cetera. We have a, a meta of version, so we can later maybe upgrade it, do some traffic splitting. And we register a sidecar service that has the upstream of payments. Right? So I already deployed this. So let's see if this works. Oh, still typoed it. OK, cool. So we get JSON output, right? But we also have, first let me show, whoop, console. We see, let me make that bigger. <laughs> we see that we have the payment service, it's registered. We have the sidecar service, we have web and its sidecar service. And web actually has an upstream to payments, right? So everything seems to be configured correctly. Here we see the call that it does in JSON, but just to make it more simple, to visualize, this is what's happening. We're calling web, which has like an internal IP address, and it's calling payments, which is also on the on-prem network in this case. OK, cool. Now we want to make the first step to go into the currency application, right? So let's start up an extra VM where we are running the currency application, the microservice that we tried to split off, and we want to test if the application works. So we want to expose it to our developers. They can test it. Um, of course, it's going to be fine because we don't write bugs. It's the users that break the things. So we'll deploy that. And currency just has a sidecar but doesn't route to anything else. And then what we want to do is we want to write a router that if you call the service payments and it matches the path slash currency and you have um, the group of dev will route to currency. So that way we can actually test the application without other people breaking it for us. So. Let's do step two. So we have the currency service. We have the sidecar. Everything is healthy. And I wrote this configuration to the central config. I'm using the CLI, but we could also use Terraform, for instance, to manage the, that state. So if we now go to localhost 9090, we can see that we're ending up at payments v1, right? That's what we wanted. If we go to currency, we still end up at payments v1. Still good. Okay. Now we're developers, and we can go to currency. So now we can test the application, prod it, do crazy things, load testing, etc. Nobody's going to be impacted because fake service was really popular. So. We need to keep that running and make sure that the payments keep coming in. So now that we know it's working, we want other teams to get access to this currency application. Um, so we want to remove the clause where we, as developers, only have access. So let me do that. So basically, all we do is remove that one match. So now everything that matches slash currency will get routed which if I use the UI is easier. So if we call slash currency, we end up at the currency. If we call anything else, we end up at payments, right? So now we have this microservice that we can start using in breaking up more of our monolith. Okay. So we're now in this state, right? We have our monolith still, we have our little microservice, and web is calling it. But we want to go to this, where all our normal users will go to the payments monolith, making money, 
And then our test group can try out a new version of the payments uh, service, which instead of calling the currency function internally, we'll call it over the internet, or sorry, local network in this case still, and call the currency microservice. So again, we will just use the service router to actually do the routing on the headers, but we now have two versions of the application, so we need to decide which one we pick. So what we can do is we can use a service resolver to create subsets of our service. And we can use any tag or metadata. In this case, I had the metadata of version, so I can use that to create a subset for version one and version two. And then in the bottom light pink one, you can see that if we're in the test group, we wanna go to um, the, the new version of the application. Okay, so let's create this A-B testing. So we're gonna start another VM in this case, because VMs are free. Um, <clears throat> we start that up and it now has an upstream on localhost and we see that we have a service called version two. The service registration Whereas before, payments didn't call anything, is now calling currency on localhost. And very important, we see the version two there. And we need to create these subsets so we can actually route to them, right? So very simple for the service payments. If anything you call doesn't match one of these, you end up at version one, so that's the default. But if we have the version two, then we want to end up at the one with meta version two. And we can use these subsets in our router now. This looks pretty much the same as the one we made for the currency, only now we want to route to a subset of the services. So it only goes to the V2 part. And you can see that I didn't specify the V1 here because it was the default, so by default it'll just go to that, it'll just fall through these. If it doesn't match anything, it'll try to go to the default. Okay, so let's apply this. Whoop, so there we go, we have the payment service. Refresh this. You can now see we have two tags, V1 and V2. Wait for it to get healthy. There we go. It's always the scariest part when things don't become healthy. So we have v1, v2, and it has the metadata. So what we should be able to do now is if we curl localhost 9090, and we do that, we end up on v1, because we're not in the test group. But if we're actually in group test, we actually get a longer call chain, because we're now calling the extra service of currency. Right? And our test group can, can keep testing this. If things break, we can roll out again. Doesn't matter because we're not making money off of our test group. The other application will still be running. Right? Normal users will still pay as we want. Okay, we're slowly getting there. We now have this situation where basically 100% of traffic is going to our monolithic application and only the test group goes to the other one. But what we want to do is slowly introduce these users to our new application, right? We want to traffic shift from the old one to the new one. And then if everything goes well, we go to 50%. And because we don't write bugs, we'll go to 100% and then we can phase out the old application. Okay, so we can do that by combining the uh, subsets that we already created and start traffic splitting between them, right? And you can have as many subsets as you want and traffic split between them as long as the total is 100. Okay, so let's create a canary release and start doing this. Uh, so let me show the code first. So to create the traffic splitting, we just write this central config. In this case, 50% goes to subset v1, 50% goes to subset v2. Seems simple. Uh, if I remember which step we were, five, okay. Okay, wrote it. 
So let's try the UI. V2, V1, V1, V2. So you can see that we're now bouncing between the two versions, right? And then the other one's below here somewhere. All right. And if we refresh, we're still on V2, and then V1 has the old one. Okay, so half of the users can keep testing this, we'll keep track of our monitoring, see that nothing crazy happens, like maybe it doesn't respond well under load. We can always roll back. But in this case, it seemed to be acting really well. So let's apply new file that puts everything on V2. OK, cool. So now we only get V2, right? We just migrated from one service to the other without ever changing web, which routes anywhere, and without changing the applications. We can very easily switch just by changing the configuration of the service mesh. OK, so now the interesting part, multi-cluster networking, right? Now that we have all these little microservices, we want to go to the coolest thing, because we've heard this buzzword here every time, Kubernetes, right? Everybody wants it. I think we should just create a drinking game out of it, where if somebody says Kubernetes, shot. So we want to move to a multi-cluster networking environment where slowly we can move towards Kubernetes. We still need some things in our data center because the payment service we're not going to move because it's like a COBOL application. It, it's like on a mainframe. Well, that probably wouldn't work with service mesh, but the thing is, multi-cluster networking is hard. There's a lot of knobs and things you have to twist to get that to work. Because has anybody ever tried to federate Kubernetes clusters together? It's a real big fun. You look very happy, Dima. <laughs> so say, for instance, what if you get the same IPs on multiple pods? Like, how do you route that? Like, if I have an API in the back end, and they both get the same IP, and service discovery says, oh, it's on that IP on that port. Well, in my demo, all the ports are the same. What do we do? Right? And what if we're using things like GKE or AKS? Then we're using a cloud provider, and we want to communicate back to our data center. Do we now have to open up the entire range of IPs of Google Cloud? Uh, the answer is actually yes. <clears throat> so that's not what we want, right? Because then we basically throw away our security just to make that move. And how do we integrate non-Kubernetes things with Kubernetes? Communicating one way is pretty easy, but then getting back in can be really hard. And it gets worse when you try to do this multi-cloud, right? Everything is amplified. Multi-cloud networking is harder, right? Because you have even more overlap, and you need to open up even more. So let's see how we can slowly actually do this without driving ourselves crazy, right? Because how would you normally do the multi-cloud networking, like create direct connects or put VPNs everywhere? Like, I, I don't even want to think about VPNs because in a previous job, I was doing consultancy for a company that had so many open VPN uh, servers and connections. They basically continuously had 300,000 plus clients connected to the VPN servers, and they had to be routable two ways, and they wanted to migrate to AWS. So we thought, let's put all the servers in auto-scaling groups, change one number when they grow, right? Because they wanted to grow through a million uh, clients. Well, the scaling part worked um, until you reached the VPC limits of your routes, which back then used to be 50. Mr. Amazon, is that still 50, number of routes in a VPC? Oh, OK. So eventually, we, we kind of figured it out by gluing a lot of VPCs together and then routing to other VPCs that then had routing tables that would route to other VPCs, and it was hell. So luckily, we're not going to do that today. What we're going to try to create is this situation where in DC2, our on-prem, we will have our payments application. Um, and the currency application will try to move to Kubernetes, right? That's our hip microservice. It's cloud native. It's all the buzzwords. So we're going to move that to Kubernetes. And 
in this case, actually, we'll just leave web in the data center because it's not that hip. OK. So let's make that move. Let me, while I explain this, uh, do the next step because Docker is um, strange. When it already has the images, it tries to figure out if it needs to pull it. And then it still takes like a few seconds for it to figure out, like, oh, I just have the image here. And then. So what I'm doing here is I'm using K3S, which is a very lightweight Kubernetes distribution, which is awesome for local development. If you want to try running Kubernetes locally on your machine, I highly recommend it because it spins up really fast and it has very uh, low resource usage because it cuts out most of the fat of Kubernetes. So we're actually running K3S on Docker Compose, right? And that means that we can give it its own little network and we can connect it to the WAN network that we created before, right? So th this will be our GKE cloud little cluster, which is connected to the internet, has totally different network space than the other ones, and we're gonna connect that up. So this is what I was saying where Docker is like, oh, well, you think that image is there? Oh, no, it's up to date. Don't know why. So let's take a look at the application that we will be deploying on the cloud. So when I spin up the K3S cluster, I'm also installing the Helm chart of console. So we'll actually have a console server there. And we will have some magic sauce, which is the mesh gateway, which I'll get into in a bit. So the mesh gateway will advertise its WAN address. So the address is reachable on the internet to console. So then the other mesh gateways will know how to reach it. And then we're going to be federating our console clusters together. So we'll actually have a shared catalog. Um, and the primary one will be our data center on premise because we trust that the most. And we will try to join that. We're actually trying to move the federation to also use the mesh gateway, so it'll be even simpler. <clears throat> and then we have our currency application, which is exactly the same application we were running in the fat VM, only it doesn't have the, the VM tag here. So this is just that Go binary, um, because we don't need to run the console agent anymore and run Envoy ourselves anymore because console will actually inject the Envoy sidecar for you and configure it for you. And we just pass in some extra uh, values for tags, so we actually tag our service in this case. Okay. And then one other thing we need to do is when the payment service wants to try and contact uh, the currency service, we need to tell the, the payment service like, Hey, currency service, the one I want you to use is actually in the data center of cloud, right? So if there is a local one, it'll just ignore that and move towards cloud because that's what we want to do. Let's see if in the meantime, every, everything came up. Yay. So, oh, the shipyard, by the way, is another tool that Nick wrote just to wrap K3S. Uh, we use it for, for demos. If you want to use that as well, feel free. Um, and what I'm actually doing after installing console, so let me just go through this, right? First, pulling all the Docker images takes a while, starting K3S, then we make sure that there's local storage, so with PVCs. Um, then we install console Helm chart, wait for console to become healthy, which takes like 16 seconds, and then wait for the console client, so the actual machine, to get healthy. And then I'm exposing um, console and the mesh gateway on the WAN in this case, so I can connect the mesh gateways together, right? So let's see what this does, right? Because I already wrote the configuration there as well. So you think it will work? Like, is it magic? I don't think that worked. Hold on. <laughs> Oh, we're still going to on-prem, so then I think I didn't write the config. Let me double check. No, we didn't deploy currency v2 yet, so kind of makes sense. We only have a cloud. 
so we need to do make step eight. Okay, so we wrote that. So let's actually check console, right? Well, it's not going to be in on-prem, right? Version one is in on-prem, but we actually now have an extra data center, which is called cloud, which has our new version of currency running. And it also has your mesh gateway running, so would it work? No, but it doesn't. <laughs> and that's because on the other data center, we don't have a mesh gateway yet. So we need to create our mesh gateway there. So in this case, um, we're just going to spin up another VM, right? where we use console to configure Envoy as a mesh gateway. So again, this is using Envoy underneath, right? And we're configuring the WAN address like we did before in the Helm chart, and we're exposing it on two networks. So let's apply that. Okay, Docker Compose, gateway is up. That looks good. Let's check in console if everything is healthy on-prem. There we go, we have a mesh gateway. Let's try this again. Okay, so let me move it like this and put them into columns. So we can actually see that we're going from web on premise with its own network space, right? 0, 5, 0, 10, or 10, 5, 0, 10, calling something in its own network, and then it's moving to the cloud Kubernetes cluster and it's just routing there and responding, right? We didn't have to make the applications aware of that we're now moving the applications to another cloud. We don't have to do that. We just configure the service mesh and it'll do it for us. Okay, so now that we've tasted Kubernetes, one Kubernetes cluster is not enough, right? Because yesterday we actually heard that a lot of organizations are moving from a monolithic cluster with a lot of nodes to micro clusters. It's going to be the new hip thing. I think Brett coined the, the phrase. So let's create a new application because we want to make more money with Fake Service Incorporated. And we're going to deploy an API on our existing Kubernetes clusters. And we're going to spin up an other cluster, um, which will be the next thing. So instead of cloud, we're going one level up, we're going to space. So let's make that. So while this is spinning up and while we're waiting for Docker to figure out it already has the images, let me show some configuration. So again, pretty much the same um, values file for the Helm chart. The only difference is the IPs, right? So the external IPs are different, but Kubernetes will actually use exactly the same IPs internally, right? So we could get that situation where two pods get exactly the same IP. I, I had it once. Um, I kind of hope we're going to have it again. Um, and then again, it's going to join the cluster so everything's hooked up together. And then we're going to deploy our two applications. So we have an API application. We're going to inject the sidecar service. We're going to um, configure an upstream to backend because API wants to reach backend. And again, it's pretty much the same service. We just pass it to configuration. And in this case, I'm uh, creating a service so I can go to it with localhost again. Uh, so I can just show you in the browser how it works. And then the backend, pretty much the same, but it doesn't need an upstream, so we just inject the sidecar for it. Doesn't do a whole lot more. And again, we want to tell the API that if you're looking for a backend, go to space, which sounds really weird when I say that. Let's see how we're doing. OK, nearly there. Waiting for console to get healthy. Oh, there we go. Everything's up. Exposing console and the mesh gateway. Okay, so let's check in the browser. Everything's correct. We have on-prem, cloud, and space, right? 
And the mesh gateway is going to stay unhealthy because the way it works in Envoy is that it won't generate any listeners until it has services. So we need to deploy something so it'll be help, uh, healthy and happy. So let's create our service. So we're going to apply the applications. So basically just running kubectl apply, right? And I'm using the shipyard tool to actually execute into the cluster and then run it so we actually have access to the correct co configuration. So that one's deployed. Then we deploy the backend to the other cluster. And then I'm exposing the uh, API on port uh, 19090 so we can actually curl it. So let's see if this actually works. OK, works. Let's try the UI. OK, cool. So we actually see that we're now going from one Kubernetes cluster to the other. Unfortunately, they just missed each other's IP, right? So one is .12, the other one is .11. I have a screenshot where they're both .12, which I was really excited about. And then now it every time gives 11, which is kind of annoying. Right? So we first had the connection going from data center, like VMs, right? Because it doesn't only have to be Kubernetes. We can hook everything up together, right? First, we had on-prem to Kubernetes. Now we have Kubernetes to Kubernetes. Let's say we want to make money off of this application, right? So we need a payment service in this as well, but we don't want to recode the payment service. Let's just use the one we have in on-prem, right? Let's try and hook up everything together. So what do we need to do? We need to, uh, where's the, change our backend because the backend needs to call the payment service, right? So we define the upstream, and then in this case, in the application, it also needs to call that, that upstream, right? Just on localhost, it doesn't need to know where it is. And then as before, we want to add to the resolver we already had for payments. We want to add the redirect so we know that, oh, payments, Go to on-prem. That, that's where you'll find the correct version. So let's do that. OK, everything seems to work. Backend is running in space still. That's still healthy. So let's see what happens. OK, it's cloud going to space. Going to on-prem. Oh, don't know what that did. And then the funny thing is, remember that we were calling currency from the payment service? So we're actually going back to cloud to resolve that request. So basically, we're going from cloud to space to on-prem to cloud. And then once it responds, it's basically going back that whole chain. So in the end, it ends up where it started. right? So some key takeaways, right? Going multi does not have to be scary, right? You, if you don't do it in a big bang migration, you can slowly make those steps. You don't have to rewrite everything and move to a new solution, right? Because most companies will not be able to do that. You can do it step by step and do it incrementally and do it safe. And Service Mesh really helps you with that. And it gives you a simple and secure service segmentation on top of that, so everything's secure as well. And by using Mesh gateways, you can basically get effortless multi-cloud and multi-cluster networking. And this is all free in the open source console version, so why not try it, right? And underneath, it's just Envoy, which is amazing. So that was my talk. I'll put on. The link again, if people still want to take a picture of the URL. Thank you. I have no idea how we are on timing. Are we good? OK, we're good. OK, thank you, Eric. We are good. We are, have 10 minutes for questions. Please feel free to write your questions on Telegram. 
I've, I'm really sad there is no questions up to this point. That, that is really not fascinating. <laughs> oh, okay, we are, you are a part of Canary deployment. Uh, same for me as well. Uh, just let us, let us try, please. Can, can you please raise your hands who don't have this specific talk in the Telegram schedule? So who doesn't have it? Do we want to okay, post just post two people in the room. Three, three. Okay. <laughs> True Canary deployment leave. Okay, I, I have a question. Regarding the final bit, when you connected all the things and you really, uh, what do you do? You go the whole circle, right? It, yeah. It's not really good for performance. No, <laughs> it's, it's a bad idea to do it, uh, well, but you can. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Right? That's, like, that's really great, but uh, can, can, I, performance. can I please don't go that circle and can I configure so my services talk to each other within a single micro, micro data center, <laughs> within a single data center, if they have such ability. Yes, you can. Like now, I forced the connection to go over the cloud, but you can use all those other configurations, like the, the splitting and the resolving, to more um, smartly route that. And then if you use things like prepared queries, you can actually do um, queries for service discovery on latency. So you can say, give me the service that has the lowest latency. And if that one is, for instance, down, then you can route to the other one. Okay, can I query some discoveries at the query time? Sorry? So, uh, can I query it at the query time? So the configuration you had was kind of static. So yeah. you, you specify, oh, yeah, I want to go to the cloud. Yeah, but right? you can create prepared queries in console um, that also has like wildcards and things like that. And so you can write more complex service queries and use those instead of just having the simple static name, right? Then you can do more advanced things. But in case of the demo, I just wanted to get the worst situation where you end up at the same one. Yeah, that's great. And where do we store all that configuration? So the configuration is stored centrally in console, and then it distributes that state over the, the service. So does it look like a so GitOps? In the plane. Okay, in control plane. And does it mean that we are, it's kind of an application thing, right? Um, so we treat this configuration as a application code, which is kind of weird application, but still. Well, you, you don't have to do it as application code. Like in this case, I had it in the JSON files, but the console Terraform provider actually lets you write this configuration as well. So you could configure some of these rules to be more an infrastructure kind of thing. But say, for instance, if you want to try a Canary release for your dev group, I think that that should actually live with the developers. Like, they, they control that life cycle to, I want to test my application. Um, like, I think if you build it, you, you run it, so. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, you showed that, well, it, sh it works from your machine. Right, yeah. <laughs> it works on your machine. You have YAML files, and that's fine. Uh, suppose we have central configuration, I don't know, server or Git server, which con contains all the YAML files, right? It, does it work like that? Or we have like tons of, uh, thousands of developers who have different, bit, di different bits. Like well, different. If, if I was gonna do it with my applications, I would put these kind of things, like the service um, configuration, I would put them in my, my Git code, and then on push in a pipeline actually apply these things when you also deploy your application. You can then, at the same time, configure the, the service mesh. And then, like some of those things, like for instance, traffic splitting, you might want to either do manually or triggered by events in your environment. Like if the, the load, you're, you're checking the load, if it stays healthy for long enough, you might want to try and up the, the percentage to the new version. Like if you can automate those things, that's even nicer. Okay, but still I have to write my own code for that kind of automation, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing that right now. So with, with Nomad, we're actually thinking about doing that automatically. So Nomad will actually test your applications, like how it's performing and if it's doing well, it'll try to increase the, the canary and then configure that. And then so basically integrate with the deployments that are in Nomad. But for Kubernetes, we don't have like an integration for that. Yeah, I see. Is there a... Uh, 
Yep. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Something called Flagger, F-L-A-G-G-R. I'm guessing they dropped the E because it's more cool. With an E, okay. Okay. I need so to that, check that. Th that's cool. And how do we test it? So suppose you have a bunch of YAML files. Uh, can you uh, test it to validate if it is consistent, like bits missing, or it's not consistent with the other bits of environment? Um, you mean the, the service con configuration or? Yeah, yeah, configuration. Okay, so because it's stored locally, um, it gets merged into that con configuration. So it's not like, oh, I have a version here and a version there. It's all one central version, so. Yeah, yeah, what I mean is uh, you specify, say, you want to go to the space, right? Yes. What if I misspell the space? What if I just put a typo there? Then it won't route. <laughs> Yeah, and it will kill production, right? Um, I'm actually not sure if it... Let's try. Because <laughs> it might actually just validate. I've, I've never typoed data center, so I'm actually kind of... Let's see, where was it? Um, Multi-cloud. I will go here. Sopsa, sup, sup. There we go. Okay. What was it called, backend? Oh. Well, I can typo in commands, apparently, so. So, yeah, it did apply it. But that's a good one. I need to bring that back to the developers. Thank you. OK, that, <laughs> that's, that's cool. And the next question is, well, uh, uh, does it really work? Yes. Can I please open the browser? So this, oh, if the application works. Yeah, I mean, what does it do? So how does it look like? Did it just create our data center for us? No. <laughs> oh, that's that, that would be cool if you just typo and you get a data center. <laughs> so if it can't resolve it, it'll probably fall back. Oh, I'm calling the wrong port, so. No, we just get the 503 because it cannot resolve that service, because the mesh gateway, so the way it works is it, um, when, say for instance, API wants to talk to backend, API doesn't know where backend is, right? So it just goes to the local port on the proxy, and the proxy knows that, okay, I have um, my clusters locally, and it shows that it's in data center something something. So it'll pass it on to the mesh gateway. Right? And the mesh gateway, it doesn't look into your traffic because everything's encrypted. It'll just look at the SNI headers to figure out to which other gateway it needs to route it. So in this case, there's no gateway called sub, 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 something. Or sorry, no cl uh, cluster called that. So it'll fail. If it can resolve it, it'll send it over WAN or whatever network to that other mesh gateway which then can use the same SNI headers to route it to the correct local cluster. So in this case, it fails because it doesn't know which data center to send it to. Any, any questions? OK. And we, this gateway, uh, which is one per, one per data center, right? The gateway um, you can have m multiple. So if you want failover, you can just have as many as you want next to them, and they'll just work together, because basically they get their configuration from console to configure the local clusters, so it doesn't matter if there's multiple of those, they, they just know how to route to the other side and to services locally. So. Yeah, yeah, and coming to that configuration, how often does it update the configuration for local proxies? Is so it it's, it's live, right? Because the Envoy proxy uses the service discovery to like live reload once any changes happen. So the configuration is like instant, like in the sidecars. OK, OK, that's cool. I think we can close the session.
Let's so welcome once again Eric. Thank you. Thank you.